Hello, everybody, and thanks for joining us for another ex exciting installment of Mid-American Gardener. You might have noticed that I'm not Diane Nolan, but I am Scott Mazingo. I'm filling in for a voiceless Diane yet again this evening, so hopefully we'll have a great show, and Diane, we're wishing you best, um, and thanks for bringing some flowers by for us to enjoy, too. Uh, I am a product manager for Burpee Home Gardens and Ball Horticultural Company, so I will hopefully be able to answer any questions that you might have about annuals, perennials, and how to take care of those things. But it's not just me tonight. We have a really exciting panel um, who have brought some show and tell items to share as well as answer your questions. So we might as well dive right into this show and start at the end down here with uh, Dr. Jim Angel. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I'm Jim Angel. I'm the Illinois State Climatologist, and I'm here today to talk, amongst other things, about rain gauges. We've got a couple here that I've kind of collected over the years, so these are nice small gauges you can get at most hardware stores and things like that. And so here's di two different flavors of those, so one's round and one's square. They're pretty nice. Uh, these are a little bigger openings than, than what you might see in some of the freebies that they give away. So that's and you want a bigger opening. That, that allows you to collect the rainfall better. And it's important to have a rain gauge at your actual site because you know how much rain that fell at the airport or, or somewhere else uh, is not going to be important for uh, what's happening in your, your yard because you get uh, quite a bit of variation from place to place. Now we actually use a, a bigger gauge for professional uh, <laughs> measurements of rainfall. So this is a, a four inch gauge here, so four inches wide there. And we use this in one of our volunteer networks. So it's very useful in that regard. That is fantastic. And I love that you brought different sizes to show and maybe people could have one of those and know when to turn their lawn irrigation on and off. That's exactly. Great. So Marianne, you've brought some stuff to share with us as well. Yes, I did. I am Marianne Metz. I'm a horticulturalist and landscape designer. And I happen to be a Japanese maple collector. And what I have this evening is but a few varieties that I have found. Actually, in my backyard, I didn't really take them from anybody. but. Um, you can see the different uh, colors and textures that are coming in the spring, as well as in the fall when they have, again, beautiful colors. But the spring is really a wonderful time to uh, enjoy the colors and textures of these plants. Um, and, and names like um, Fire Glow and Orange Dream and um, Coral Bark Maple, and that's an interesting part of some of the Japanese maples. Uh, the Coral Bark Maple actually has coral bark on it, and the colder it gets, uh, and the more sun they get, the more red they get with a beautiful chartreuse foliage. So it's really an interesting genus and, I, uh, and species, and I, I think they're a great addition to most gardens. Those are fantastic. The colors are just amazing. So some of those work in the shade a little bit too, right? Uh, these actually prefer yeah. a little bit of protection in, in our environment. That's yes. great. That's great. So we've also got behind the duck blind here Dr. Don White to share something with us as well. I'm Don White. I'm an emeritus professor of plant pathology from the University of Illinois and more recently uh, a master gardener intern. I taught introductory plant pathology and A Course in Diseases of Field Crops and A Course in Diseases of Ornamentals and Turf Grasses. And I brought my colorful flowers. This is cedar apple rust. And you can see here the galls and they're rust colored. And this is actually a real trophy size. The, uh, what happens here, there's either cedar apple rust or cedar hawthorn rust, and you really can't tell on the basis of the gall. The rust fungus will produce spores in about another month that then will be blown to either apple or cedar, depending on which rust it is. There'll be a leaf blight phase, and then in the fall, there'll be spores coming back to cedar, and it takes two years for the galls to develop, and then the cycle repeats again. So this is a two-year thing. Really, if you think about it, these galls are not really going to do any damage to cedar. They can be extremely damaging. Uh, the fungus can be extremely damaging on hawthorn and can be very damaging on apple. So I wouldn't even bother with it on cedar. Just kind of enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> it does give the uh, cedar a little bit of color. Okay. Fantastic, and a little bit gross, too. So yeah. <laughs> thanks for sharing that. Now, we're going to try something just a little bit different. We're, we have actually someone who submitted a video question for us for the first time. So we're going to cue that up and hang in there. We'll be right back. Or maybe we'll try something else. We're going to go right back to a couple of emails uh, down here. So Jim, did you have your second question for you? Yes, I do. I have a general question about how do I prune berries in the spring. And they've got, I'm assuming they're meaning 
things like raspberries and, and those kinds of vegetables and our fruits. And, you know, most of the, the ones that I'm familiar with, the, the, the actual the, 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 uh, branches that bear fruit are actually the old growth. So I'm not sure you really want to prune anything in the spring. I would wait until the fall to do any kind of pruning on any of uh, any berries. Yeah, I think that sounds like a pretty safe bet. I agree. So, all right, Marianne, did you have a second question? Yes, I do. This is about Japanese uh, beetles. Almost said Japanese maple, but no, <laughs> Japanese beetles. Um, this person had uh, a lot of Japanese uh, beetles, and how do I get rid of them? And this person's tried spraying with. Uh, um, a couple of things that didn't do too well, and also mixing mashed bananas in a bucket of water, which I'd not heard of. I thought that was kind of an interesting fix, uh, but which wasn't very effective either, they say. Um, I, I find that uh, uh, systemics are very, very good insecticides for Japanese maples, but she doesn't want to use an ins insecticide. Then you hand pick them, and you drop them into a bucket of water that, that perhaps has uh, Dishwashing liquid in it to create for the surfactant so that the the beetle can't uh, fly away. That's honestly the most effective non-chemical way to get rid of Japanese maples. Unfortunately, it's kind of an icky thing to do. Japanese yeah. beetles. <laughs> oh my gosh! See, I have this thing on my mind. Yeah. Uh, Japanese beetles. Yeah, they're they're kind of a uh, pernicious uh, creature, and they come almost the same time every summer. Hard to get rid of. Yep. All right. Looks like we've got one more show and tell. Yes, item. we do. Now this is uh, I got a lot of gall. But here, <laughs> I think Diane in but here I could have razzed her. This is black knot. It's a disease that occurs on plum and cherry. You don't see it very often because usually uh, people will go out and prune these out. And you can get very good control as a homeowner if you're careful. Remove the galls. Uh, commercial orchards will remove the galls and they'll also have fungicide sprays so they try to do make sure they don't have any of it the trouble is it grows completely around the uh, stem and it can cut off the movement of water and food materials and kill that stem so this can be a disease that's easy to control but it can be damaging and one other little thing i'll mention is i understand on japanese beetles that you don't want to use a trap because it brings it into your yard. But you, what you'd like to do is buy a neighbor the trap. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty good. Yeah. The one oh. thing happened last year because of the drought, we didn't have as many Japanese beetles. I, my understanding was they do not like hot, dry weather. Yes. Oh. Fingers crossed. Oh. So yeah. maybe, we can, maybe we'll have fewer this year as well. Yes. All right, so I think we're going to give this video thing one more try. We did have somebody submit a video, and we want to run that right now and uh, maybe answer your question in some new technology. So let's check that out. Hello, Mid-American Gardener. I have a question for you. This is the front of my house. I had a lot of uh, bushes that I just ripped out because they were big and old and unruly, and I'd like to put some Illinois-type friendly plants up there. What would you uh, recommend? Again, this is facing to the north. And also, right here, look at this. We've got a beautiful um, oak tree and another area to landscape out here. I ripped that, everything out, cleaned it all up. And I'd be looking to you for advice because I know you guys are the team to do it. Thanks. All right, so that was fantastic. What do we have uh, for some plant suggestions for that sort of shady north side? Well, I did hear him uh, say that he, he would like, uh, I don't know if it, he meant native Illinois plants, which might be a little more difficult to come by, but there's several shrubs that would be more than appropriate. Arborvitae take a little bit of shade, certainly. Um, hydrangeas, if you want flowers. Japanese maples, <laughs> if you don't want too much height. Or if you do want height, I, I think against the, the kind yes. of beige colored siding, one of those Some, colorful maples oh, could be would gorgeous. Oh, it would be lovely, the chartreuse yeah. foliage, yeah. There's a few things I thought of. Yeah, you know, one of the other ones I like is chokeberry. You know, there's oh, yeah. the black and, mm -hmm. and red varieties, Absolutely. and those are interesting. Mm -hmm. and, and they are native, so that helps. Yeah. Great. Want to throw I mentioned one in? Japanese use, and people went yuck because they're, <laughs> they're common, but they are easy to prune. It's true, they're very fast. And they don't get out of bounds because you can prune them way back. And, and, you know, to that point, th they may not be the most exciting, but on the north, I still think every landscape should have a little bit of evergreen color, Excellent. something yep. to look at in the winter, and that's, that's an excellent variety. So, 
All right, that was a lot of fun. And now I think we're going to head to the phones and take line two with a question about peonies. Hi there. Yeah, uh, could you tell me anything about the new peonies that are out there? Um, I'm not sure, but they appear to be a cross between a regular peony and maybe a tree peony. And I'd just like to know um, if you know anything about them and what the care, what kind of care they would require. Yeah, I, I actually know a little bit about peonies. Dive right in. Um, <laughs> it is, they are crossed between a herbaceous peony and a tree peony, and they're usually referred to as an Ito hybrid. That's the person who hybridized them. And they're, they're lovely plants. They, they're very interesting. They have the um, exotic flowers of the tree peony and uh, a lot of the great habits of a herbaceous peony. And what they, ha what they do is die down uh, to the ground in the winter, like the herbaceous, but then have the exotic flowers like the tree peonies. And basically, they're pretty much the same um, care as a herbaceous peony, but I wouldn't cut the stems off in the fall. I think I'd wait until the spring to do that if there are any stems above the ground. And just let it do its thing. Uh, full sun, well-drained soil, and mulch. Fantastic. That was great. That's, uh, we had a peony expert. And I think we're going to be able to answer this next one really well, too. We have a phone call in line three with a question about rain gauges. Hi there. Hello. What's your question for us tonight? Yeah, i just going to make a comment with the man's uh, statement about the rain gauges, which was very interesting because I've just discovered and found myself a seven-inch rain gauge. And we've had this rain here within what the last two to three weeks off and on and it's not quite measured up to any of my other rain gauges but I'm trying to figure out and see what I got to do with it but it has been interesting to have the seven inch gauge have you ever seen one before that's my interest well, that's an interesting question. I've never seen a seven inch. Uh, I mean, most of the ones that we have are, uh, uh, as far as the diameter goes, are either four or eight inches. Uh, but the one like I just showed here is, let me get this one again. This one can measure up to 12 inches of rain at one time. So you could stick it out. Well, hopefully we never get 12 <laughs> inches in one time. But uh, if you get it out over a week, you can measure it in that uh, for uh, that amount of time. But yeah, some of those rain gauges are, some are better than others. It's, it's, sometimes you have to watch the markings. Sometimes those may be off a little bit. And I also forgot to mention is that it's good to have it out in an open area. You don't want it under the shade tree or next to the shed. If you get it in a fairly open area, that'll give you a lot better measurements than, than anywhere else. That's fantastic. If they get any bigger, we're just going to have five-gallon buckets uh, out there. That's it. There you go. <laughs> All right, we've got a question on line four about arborvitae. Hi there, what's your question? Good evening. I um, have four arborvitae that are probably six, seven feet tall. And I think as a result of the heavy snow we had earlier uh, this year, um, they have opened at the top, uh, sort of splayed out uh, at the top, mushroomed out. And I'm wondering what I need to do. Should I wrap them up or try to pull them back together? Or is that happen naturally, what do I need to do? So it sounds like they're kind of falling apart a little bit. Anybody want to I had, I had that very thing happen. <laughs> <laughs> I did too. A lot of people had, yeah. It was that, that uh, snow we had in April that was so was, wet and so heavy, just oh, kind of yeah. clobbered a lot of my it, evergreens. It was incredible. looks like a, a, a green banana peeled. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's really interesting. Um, I find that um, it's not going to go up naturally. It will uh, recover somewhat but you really need to take some kind of soft material. And I think it's one of the best used for old pantyhose. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a soft material and it's actually gonna hold the, hold the uh, plant together. And go up into the plant and, and tie, it, tie it together uh, almost to its original position where it was. And it, it's, it's gonna probably take its form back, but this is gonna support it. And it'll hold it in the snow, probably. So I think that's one, one way. Okay, that sounds like a great tip. All right, we'll take um, one more call on line six. We have a question that looks like about bleeding hearts. So uh, what's your question for us? Hello? Um, Hi. There uh, we go. I have a huge bleeding heart plant in Tomahawk, Wisconsin. And uh, 
I, I would like to transplant it down here to Petersburg, Illinois. And I was just wondering when it would be a good time to do that, and if I can do that and transplant it. It is a very huge plant. I've had it probably for close to 10 years, and it, it runs about 6 to 8 feet tall. It's a huge plant. Oh, gosh. <laughs> All right. Um, anybody want to handle when to dig and divide? First, have you ever heard of one that tall? Well, <laughs> it's That's Wisconsin. We'll go with that. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's Texas. It's a little bit, yeah, it's a little yeah, bit Texas, there, Texas maybe. Center, yeah. So, yeah. That's pretty amazing. I, I think I would, uh, I find that bleeding hearts are usually blooming in uh, early spring, but about now. Around now, yeah. And it's probably not the best time to transplant right now. Um, I think if it's not one that goes dormant in the summertime, you could probably get a hold of it in really early summer, or even after it's flowered is maybe the better time to do it, so. Yeah, I think so too. I, you can, uh, they tend to be, especially if it's 10 years old, they've, yeah. they've got a lot. You could probably take a piece of that. That might be Just about any way. time and then maybe prune the flowers yeah. off of it, so. All right, in the interest of trying some new things again tonight, hang in there with us. We'll be right back to your calls, but we wanna share this really quick fun fact with you. So we'll be right back. that was really cool and just because I'm in the industry I'm gonna say if you're still hanging on to your poinsettias it's time to let them go and buy a new one next year <laughs> <laughs> all right so we'll go right back to your phone calls we have a caller on line five who has a question about tomato seeding hello there what's your question for us uh, my question is this year I started some uh, tomato seedlings inside and uh, for some reason it looks like the uh, leaves on the plants are starting to curl under and roll under and I was just wanting to know what possibly could be the problem. Anybody want to handle a little bit of curling and rolling? I'll take a guess at it. It's <laughs> probably because they're growing inside. Uh, how tall are they? Oh, five, six inches tall. Okay. I'm getting ready to plant tomatoes this week. I'm probably crazy. <laughs> but. What I would do is go ahead and pick the lower leaves off and you can just plant deep. In other words, you can bury a lot of that stem and the roots will form up and down the stem on tomatoes. Now you can't do that on everything, but the best thing to do is to bury them so you've got maybe two inches or three inches of plant above ground and the rest of it just goes straight down with them and it's a great way to do it and you won't really worry about those leaves anyway. I typically find, especially in tomatoes, you'll see leaf curl anytime yep. as a response to stress. So sometimes it could be too much water, sometimes it could be not enough water. The stress is, it's, it's that cheater answer that you always get to use. But most of that stress is probably due to them just being inside. So really, hang in there just a little bit and do exactly like uh, Dr. White said and you'll be just fine. So, all right. We've got another caller on line two with a question for us about insect repellent. Hi there, what's your question for us? Yes, I was wanting to find out, is there any organic or natural substance that you could put on your garden, uh, you know, gardens to keep the insects and pests off of them? Well, organic pesticides? <laughs> organic I don't know any names insect of repellents? organic ones, particularly, uh, of organic. Not probably Sa OMRI certified organic, but Safe there are... Safers is maybe one of the most easy to use. It's not organic, I don't believe, but it is close to organic, safers. Yeah, I think it would, they would probably call it sustainable, maybe not, Perhaps, it has a couple yes. of things that aren't, but um, yeah, there might be a few, I mean, that might be a good question for Google, right? Yeah, but I haven't absolutely. really had a whole lot of experience with those either. Of so. organic, no, I haven't. So, but I do know, I have used safer, like you mentioned, and that's yeah. been a really good one for us, so. All right. Uh, Next caller has a question for us about red sedum on line four. Hi there, what's your question for us? Yes, uh, I'm interested in um, planting some red sedum, and I'd like to, I have a rock, a rock garden, and I, I'd like to know what size 
of a pot I should use. And if I do use a pot, will it come back year after year? Are you wanting to use the pot in the garden, or you want, you're taking the plant out of the pot? No, it's a rock garden. It's all rock. I'm going to set a pot on the rock okay. and plant, plant the sedum in the pot. Right. Okay. And I'd like to know how big of a pot I should use. And will it come back, since it's planted in the pot, will it come back year after year? I think that you can leave uh, sedum in a pot. You just have to be careful what kind of pot you're using because the freeze-thaw cycles around here um, could be very damaging to the container. So I, I, I've seen pots that look like rocks. And yeah. they're a material, or, or some of them are rocks, actually, hollowed out. So if you're careful about the, the container that you uh, purchase, you can leave it out. And I actually had seed them outside in a container this last winter. Of course, it wasn't very cold, but um, came through the winter just fine. Yeah. Sedum's pretty hardy. I think a shallower yes, pot is. rather than a deeper I, pot I would also help. I think that's exactly right. It drains to... quicker, and they like the drier situation. Yep, yep. So, all right, these have all been great questions tonight. We have another question on line three about daffodils. Hi there, what's your question for us? Actually, uh, it's about um, the chemical in daffodils that make it deer resistant and unappetizing. Sure. Is, is that oxalic acid? Who wants to jump in on that one? Not me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> Might have stumped the panel know. on that I, one. I don't yeah. know what the chemical yeah. is myself. Yeah. Don, you gotta... I've given up on a deer resistant plant. <laughs> <laughs> My deer eventually find a way. It might well be. That would really ir irritate their throats and their mouths. But I yeah. don't know for sure. All right. Well, it looks like we had our first stump the panel for the yeah. evening. So. <laughs> and what do they win, right? Yeah, right. yeah. unfortunately not an answer. <laughs> they win two Bambies from my yard if they want them. <laughs> Um, I'm looking for a clue as to where our next call might be coming from. So I'm hoping that someone will tell me where that is in just a second. But we also p might possibly have a quiz that we could fill um, for just okay. a minute here. So, <laughs> All right. Um, so I guess the question that I've got for the panel is um, w the deer resistant question. Is there anything, you know, when we were talking about some of the bulbs and things coming out, what have you had success with for deer resistance maybe to keep deer away from the plants that are coming up, tulips and things like that? Any products that you guys have used that you kind of like? No? You've completely given up, but... I, I heard that deer actually do like, or don't like daffodils, so daffodils, so I, I think I've been told yeah. that many times. Yeah. Okay. So I was thinking, you know, some of the like, liquid fence things, or maybe oh, uh, you products, know, yeah. other products to Rather keep. Something you know. that, yeah, liquid fence yeah. is supposed to be one of the most effective. Great. So. Great. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we can jump back to the phones now. We have a question on line two with a question about fertilizing tomatoes. So, what's your question for us about fertilizing tomatoes? Well, my understanding, I I don't know the requirements of the plant itself, but uh, I understand you're supposed to add. Uh, some nitrogen whenever they start to bloom, is that correct? Nitrogen when the tomato starts to bloom, has anybody heard that one before? I've not heard that one. Yeah. No. I typically avoid nitrogen on tomatoes. On tomatoes I find that, yeah. I find that phosphorus and potassium will help you a lot more and, and even some um, calcium nitrate. Now that could be where you're hearing because calcium nitrate is used to help prevent uh, blossom end rot and it also gives you a little bit less uh, less cracking, but I haven't heard, uh, typically extra nitrogen just causes your tomato vines to grow like crazy, but not necessarily set fruit. So exactly. I think that might be um, a little bit misleading. Yeah. So generally speaking, for, tomatoes don't need a ton of fertilizer, especially if they're in a good, uh, good quality garden soil. So. All right. Definitely. So we have a, a Japanese beetle comment for us on line six. What's your question for us about or comment about Japanese beetles? I have a Japanese maple tree, and oh. I found out the last few years if I spray a Pam garlic with garlic in it uh, on the periphery of the tree and up into the air that the Japanese beetles don't attack it as bad. And they tend to go to, uh, on my rose trellis, I hang a uh, trap with white vinegar in it, and I find them in there with the flies. Interesting. All right. So they like, they're attracted to garlic. 
Well, they stay away from my trees, oh. the garlic. <laughs> yeah, they don't, well, they're, they're they don't like the garlic. garlic. And driven into the trap. That's yeah. pretty awesome. That's pretty so. neat. Great. Well, this, f this show flies by so quickly. I think we had some great calls. We had a lot of fun with that video, so hopefully people get the idea to maybe create some of their own and send those in. Um, we just want to thank everybody for the great calls and the great panel that we had tonight. Maybe send some good wishes to Diane, and hopefully she's feeling better pretty soon, too. So everybody get out and enjoy your time in the garden, and hopefully we've given you some information to help you do that. Thanks a lot.